Chapter 2 Sankhya Yoga The Yoga of Analysis Verse 1 Sanjaya said, Shri Krishna then spoke the following words to Arjuna, whose heart was overwhelmed with pity and whose eyes were filled with tears. Verse 2 Bhagavan Shri Krishna said, Arjuna, how has such illusion overcome you at this crucial moment? This is not appropriate for an honorable man, nor does it lead to higher planets. It is the cause of infamy. Verse 3 O Partha, give up this unmanliness. It does not befit you. O chastiser of enemies, get up and do not yield to this petty weakness of heart. Verse 4 Arjuna replied, How can I counterattack such persons as Bhishma and Drona in battle, firing arrows at those who are worthy of my respect, O Madhusudana? Verse 5 It is better to live in this world by begging than killing our respectable superiors. Otherwise the wealth and property that we enjoy here in this world will be tainted with their blood. Verse 6 I do not know what is better for us, to conquer them, or be conquered by them. If we slay the sons of Dhritarashtra who are assembled here before us, I have no desire to live. Verse 7 My natural propensity as a warrior is weakening, and I am bewildered as to what is righteous. Kindly tell me what is most beneficial for me. I am your disciple surrendered unto you. Please instruct me. Verse 8 Even if I gain a substantial kingdom beyond compare, and the power of the demigods, I see nothing that can remove this grief that is eroding my senses. Anuvriti This second chapter is where the Bhagavad Gita truly begins. Bhagavad Gita literally means the song of Bhagavan, and Bhagavan means the absolute truth. Here for the first time in Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna is addressed as Bhagavan. According to Vedic scholars such as Parashara Muni, Bhagavan means one who possesses all wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation. Aishvaryasya samagrasya viryasya yashasastriya jnana vairaga yoschaiva shanambhaga itirana Translation He that possesses the attributes of sovereignty, potency, fame, wealth, knowledge, and renunciation in full is known as Bhagavan from the Vishnu Purana 6.5.74. Additionally, Jiva Goswami, the 16th century Vaishnav philosopher, says that Bhagavan is Bhajaniya Gunacha Anantachanitya, he that possesses all adorable qualities and whose all-attractive nature is such that he attracts our feelings of affection and adoration. In contemporary society, there is much debate as to whether God exists or not. First, it is necessary to define what we mean by God before his existence can be determined or dismissed. Accordingly, seers of the truth in ancient India have concluded that if there is a God, then God must necessarily be the owner and proprietor of everything. He must be all-powerful, the most famous, the most beautiful, the possessor of all knowledge, and at the same time, detached or renounced. After careful analysis, those seers of truth concluded that only Sri Krishna could be and is the ultimate fountainhead of reality, the absolute truth. These findings have been corroborated by many sages throughout the ages, from before 10,000 BCE, and are dealt with extensively in the Vedic literature, such as the Vedas, Upanishads, Puranas, Ramayana, Mahabharata, Vedanta Sutra, Srimad Bhagavatam, and Brahma Samhita, etc. Ishwara Parama Krishna Sachid Ananda Vigraha Anadhir Adhir Govinda Sarva Karana Karanam. Translation Krishna is the supreme controller. His form is made of bliss, knowledge, and eternity. He is the origin of all. He is the master of the cows and the senses. He has no other origin and he is the primeval cause of all causes. From the Brahma Samhita 5.1 Ete chamsa kala pumsa krishnastu bhagavan svayam indrari vyakulam lokam bridayanti yuge yuge 
Translation. The various avatars are either plenary expansions or parts of plenary expansions, but Krishna is the original source of all avatars. When impious elements disturb his devotees, he manifests age after age in order to protect them. From the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.3.28 Harir eva sadharadya sarva deveshwareshwara itare brahmarudradya Navageya Kadachana. Translation. Only Sri Hari, Krishna, should be worshipped as the master of the entire universe. Brahma, Shiva, and all other demigods never violate this principle at any time. From the Padma Purana. Yatra Vatirnam Krishnakyam Param Brahma Narakritim. Translation. When the Supreme Person descends in his human like form, he is Krishna, the Supreme Brahman. From the Vishnu Purana, 4, 11, 2. Tasmat Krishna eva paro devas tam dhyayet, tam raset tam bhajet tam yajet. Translation. Thus Krishna is the Supreme Person. One should meditate on him. One should delight in him. One should worship him and make offerings to him. From the Gopal Tapani Upanishad, 154. Krishir bu vachaka shabdo, nascha nivritti vachaka, tayoraikyam param brahma, krishna itya bidhiyate. Translation. The verbal root krish refers to the all attractive quality of Krishna, and the syllable na refers to his spiritual bliss. When krish is added to the affix na, it becomes the word krishna, indicating the supreme truth. From the Mahabharat. Udyoga Parva, 71.4 Arjuna has become overwhelmed with compassion for those who are about to die on the battlefield. In fact, such is his grief that he himself is prepared to die rather than kill his enemies. But Arjuna is a warrior and from a noble family. Therefore, Krishna advises Arjuna against his weakness of heart. If one is a warrior, it is one's duty to face the enemy and not cower away. Fighting is indeed a nasty business, but when duty calls, such fighting may be unavoidable. In ancient times, acts of aggression were abhorred and strictly forbidden in society and between nations. When such aggression did occur, retaliation and war were acceptable. According to the great sage Vasishta, there are six types of aggressors, and according to Manu Samhita, these aggressors are to be met with lethal response. Agnido garadaschaiva, shastra panir danapaha, kshetra dhara paharicha, shadete hyattatayina. Translation The arsonist who sets fire to one's house, one who administers poison, one who attacks with deadly weapons, one who usurps a nation's resources, one who invades and occupies a sovereign country, and one who kidnaps one's family members. All should be considered as aggressors. From the Vasishta Smriti 3.19 Atatainam ayantam hanyad eva vicharayan natatai vade dosho hantur bhavati kaschana Translation Without hesitation, a warrior should destroy aggressors, as there is no bad reaction in slaying them. From the Manu Samhita 8.350 these verses are according to the rules given in the laws of society, Artha Shastra. Yet the laws of Dharma, Dharma Shastra, which are superior to the Artha Shastra, state that one should never inflict harm on any living being. Mahimsyat Sarva Bhutani. What to say of one's family members and superiors? This was Arjuna's dilemma. Being a soft hearted devotee of Sri Krishna, Arjuna was disinclined to take up arms against his family members. But being a warrior, he had to face his destiny. In this state of bewilderment, Arjuna decided to put aside his casual relationship with Krishna as a friend and accept Sri Krishna as his guru, his spiritual master. Thus Krishna accepted Arjuna as a disciple. According to Vedic knowledge, there are numerous planets and parallel universes wherein life can be found. 
Some of these planets and universes have higher standards of living than we experience on Earth, and some are lower. If one performs one's prescribed duties in this life, then accordingly one is elevated to higher planets. However, if one neglects his duty, then only infamy and descending to lower planets awaits one in the next life. Krishna has used the word anarya, meaning non-aryan, to describe Arjuna's disinclination to follow his prescribed Vedic duties. For centuries there has been much controversy about who is an Aryan and where the Aryans came from. For the most part, all such considerations have been based upon bodily designations in order to establish one race of people as superior to another. But in Bhagavad Gita, according to the words of Sri Krishna, the Aryans are those who carry out their duties in accordance with the Vedic injunctions. Thus it is understood that the word Aryan does not pertain to a particular race of people, but to a conception of life and a way of living. Knowledge of the eternal existence of the infinite consciousness, Krishna, and the finite individual unit of consciousness, Atma, or the Self, is the key to all Vedic wisdom. This will be the central theme of Krishna's instruction to Arjuna in this chapter. Verse 9 Sanjaya said, Having thus addressed Sri Krishna, the vigilant conqueror of enemies, Arjuna, declared, O Krishna, O Govinda, I will not fight, and became silent. Verse 10 Descendant of Bharat, there between the two armies, Sri Krishna, Rishikesha, smiled and spoke the following words to the grief-stricken Arjuna. Verse 11 Bhagavan Sri Krishna said, While speaking like a wise man, you are actually grieving for that which is unworthy of grief. The wise lament for neither the living nor the dead. Verse 12 there was never a time that you, nor I, nor all these warriors assembled here did not exist, nor shall we ever cease to exist in the future. Verse 13 As the Atma passes through the bodily transformations of childhood, youth, and old age, it similarly transmigrates from one body to another at the time of death. The wise are never deluded by this transition. Verse 14 O son of Kunti, the interaction between the senses and the sense objects produce the sensations of cold, heat, pleasure, and pain. These feelings are temporary, always appearing and then disappearing. Thus, O descendant of Bharat, you must learn to tolerate them. Verse 15 O most virtuous one, a sober man who is equipoised in both pleasure and pain and remains undisturbed is certainly qualified for liberation. Anuvriti. Arjuna is lamenting for the loss of the body, but Sri Krishna does not approve of his lamentation and reminds Arjuna that all living beings are eternal. Krishna says that he, Arjuna, and all those present on the field of battle are eternal personalities. They have existed eternally in the past and they will exist eternally in the future. Arjuna is an accomplished student of Vedic thought and an associate of Sri Krishna. But for the benefit of those who will study this erudite conversation in the future, Arjuna is feigning bewilderment and confusion just to encourage the discourse. Arjuna is considered a liberated personality, and thus he is actually above ignorance and bewilderment. Although consciousness is eternal, the material body does not share this quality. The body passes through the stages of birth, childhood, youth, old age, disease, and death. At death, consciousness transfers to another body, according to the laws of material nature, karma, and begins the cycle yet again. The ever-changing body never bewilders those who are cognizant of the difference between the material body and consciousness. Embodied consciousness is said to have five stages, known as the pancha kosha, anamaya, satisfying our existence by eating, as seen in children, pranamaya, Consciousness of the preservation of one's body, Manamaya, the stage of mental awareness, Vijnanamaya, the cultivation of consciousness based on higher knowledge, understanding one is not this material body, and Anandamaya, 
cultivating and entering into one's relationship with the Supreme as part and parcel of Krishna. The first three stages, Anamoya, Pranamoya, and Manamoya, pertain to all living beings that are caught in the doldrums of material sense enjoyment. Vijnanamoya and Anandamaya concerns those who have acquired knowledge of self-realization, Vigyan, and perfection, Ananda. Those who are asleep, simply absorbed in bodily identification, never experience the world beyond their sense perception. Heat and cold, happiness and distress, pleasure and pain, birth and death, these are the perceptions of life experienced by those with no knowledge of consciousness. But those who are liberated from the bodily concept of life are awake in the conscious world and are always in balance, even in the face of opposing and contradictory situations in the material world. They are undisturbed. They are undisturbed. Verse 16. Of that which is temporary, there is no eternal existence. Of that which is eternal, there is no destruction or change. Seers of the truth have realized the constitutional position of both. Verse 17. Know for certain that individual consciousness which pervades the whole body is imperishable. Nobody can destroy the indestructible individual unit of consciousness. Verse 18. Embodied consciousness is eternal, imperishable, and infinite. Only the material body is perishable. Therefore, O Arjuna, fight. Anuvriti. Herein, Sri Krishna is reiterating the superiority of consciousness over matter. Since the time of Darwin and even amongst some philosophers of ancient India, such as Charvaka, up to the present day, there are those who think that life arises out of matter. The Big Bang Theory and other contemporary scientific ideas also support this opinion. However, the problem with such thinking is that there is no concrete evidence whatsoever to explain or demonstrate how lifeless matter ever developed the symptoms of life. The theory of evolution, as the Darwinians understand it, is substantially defeated in the fossil record, since no transitional species that are supposed to reveal the gradual evolution of living organisms from primitive species to advanced life forms have ever been discovered. Furthermore, there is no suitable model to explain where matter originated. The numerous theories, new and ancient, that expound that life arose from matter are fundamentally flawed in many ways. On the other hand, from observing microscopic living creatures to giant creatures like the elephant and whale, it is self-evident that life comes from life. Thus, the Vedic perspective on life is that all life comes from an intelligent life source, Sri Krishna. Scientific interest in finding the cause of the universe and indeed to all life, is certainly laudable. Yet when all reasonable and honest research leads us to the conclusion that life, or consciousness, is not a byproduct of matter, and the blueprint of intelligent design can be observed everywhere in all things, then it should also be intelligently concluded that superconsciousness is the cause of matter, the universe, and all living things. Verse 19. One who considers the eternal unit of consciousness to be the slayer, and one who considers it to be capable of being slain, are both in ignorance, for it neither slays nor is slain. Verse 20. The individual unit of consciousness neither takes birth nor dies at any time. It has never been created nor will it ever be created. It is unborn, eternal, indestructible, and timeless. It is not destroyed when the material body is destroyed. Verse 21. O Parta, considering that the individual unit of consciousness is eternal, unborn, imperishable, and indestructible, how can a person kill anyone, and whom does he kill? Anuvriti. It is sometimes thought that God or some source of higher intelligence has created life in the universe. But herein Sri Krishna expresses that the individual consciousness of a living being is never actually created. It exists eternally as part and parcel of Krishna, as part and parcel of the super-consciousness. In the Vedic concept of the Absolute Truth, Krishna exists eternally, along with his energies. Consciousness by that measure is never created. 
It simply exists eternally as part and parcel of the absolute truth. The characteristics of consciousness are described as unborn, eternal, indestructible, and timeless, that which is not destroyed when the body is destroyed. The effects of time on the material body are perceived as growth, maintenance, byproducts, old age, dwindling, and death. But consciousness being transcendental to matter transcends time and therefore never grows old, dwindles, or dies. In certain religious traditions, the Creator is sometimes visualized as being an old man in the sky. He is naturally thought of as old because he has fathered the universe a long time ago, and he is the oldest of all. But here again the conception of Bhagavad Gita differs dramatically. Consciousness is ever fresh and the source of consciousness. The superconscious being is always youthful and never old. Those who are engrossed in material affairs and who ignore the wisdom of Bhagavad Gita will find it very difficult to overcome the bodily concept of life and understand the difference between matter and consciousness. Verse 22 Just as one removes old clothes and accepts new ones, similarly the embodied unit of consciousness gives up old bodies and accepts new bodies. Verse 23 Weapons cannot cut the individual consciousness, it cannot be burned by fire, water cannot wet it, and air cannot dry it. Verse 24 It is indestructible, incombustible, insoluble, and cannot be withered. It is eternal, all-pervading, unchanging, immovable, and primeval. Verse 25 It is said that it is imperceptible, inconceivable, and immutable. Thus, understanding the nature of individual embodied consciousness, it is inappropriate for you to lament. Anuvriti The transcendental nature of consciousness has been described in the above verses. It cannot be cut, burned, or even touched by water or air. However, the material body is subject to all the above. Consciousness is described as eternal because it can never be destroyed. It is omnipresent because it animates and gives feelings to all parts of the body. It is unchanging because it never becomes anything other than what it is, pure consciousness. It is immovable because it does not change its constitutional position. It is primeval because it is the oldest of all. It is imperceptible because it lies beyond the range of the physical senses. It is inconceivable because it is beyond the speculative function of the mind and it is immutable because it is part and parcel of the absolute truth. Verse 26 Even if you believe that the individual consciousness is eternally subject to birth and death, still you have no reason to lament, O mighty armed one. Verse 27 For one who is born, death is certain. For one who is dead, birth is certain. Therefore you should not grieve over that which is inevitable. Verse 28. O Bharat, all living beings are unmanifest before birth, manifest between birth and death, and again unmanifest after death. What then is the reason for lamentation? Verse 29. Some consider the individual conscious unit as astounding. Some describe it as astounding. Others hear of it as astounding. And some, even after having heard about it, have no knowledge of it. Verse 30. O descendant of Bharat, the eternal individual consciousness that dwells within the bodies of all beings can never be slain. Thus you should not lament for anyone. Anuvriti. The individual unit of consciousness is difficult to understand because it is transcendental, a non-material substance, and cannot be seen with the material senses or even with the world's most powerful microscope. It is atomic in size and can only be perceived through perfect intelligence. This atomic unit of consciousness is situated in the midst of the five kinds of subtle life airs within the body, prana, apana, vyana, samana, and udana. It is located within the heart and spreads its influence throughout the body. To give us some idea of the minuteness of the atma and its positioning within the body, the Shveta Shveta Upanishad and Mundaka Upanishad provide the following information. 
बालग्राशतभागस्य शतधा कल्पितस्य च भागो जीवा सविग्येया सचानंत्याय कल्पते ट्रांसलेशन When the upper part of a hair is divided into 100 parts and again each of those parts is further divided into 100 parts each part is the dimension of the atma from the shweta shweta upanishad 59 esho nuratma chetasa veditavyo yasmin prana panchada samvivesha pranaischitam sarvamotam prajanam yasmin vishude Vibhavatyeshatma. Translation. The Atma is atomic in size and can be perceived by perfect intelligence. This atomic Atma is floating in the five kinds of airs, is situated in the heart, and spreads its influence all over the body of the embodied living beings. When the Atma is purified from its contamination of the five kinds of material airs, its spiritual influence is exhibited. From the Mundaka Upanishad 3.1.9 The cycle of birth and death, samsara, is described as a natural phenomenon for one who is embodied. Although such a conception may be considered a fatalistic worldview, both birth and death are an unwanted experience for the embodied consciousness. After experiencing life, no sane person wants to die. Everyone has the desire to live as long as possible. To that end, nowadays the producers of wonder drugs promise us eternal life, although no such life-giving cures exist at present. Everyone has to die, and before death comes, the wonder drugs and doctor's fees are sure to bankrupt the family fortune. However, death is an unnatural experience. The fact that everyone seeks everlasting life should be indicative that such a pure state of life exists beyond birth and death. Indeed it does, and Sri Krishna will shed light on that subject as this chapter develops. Verse 31 Moreover, considering your natural duty, you should not waver, as there is no better course of action for a warrior than a battle to uphold righteousness. Verse 32 O Partha, only the most fortunate warriors are favored with the opportunity to engage in such a war which has come of its own accord to you as an open door to the higher planets. Verse 33 But if you decide not to take part in this war of righteousness, your principles of dharma will be lost, fame will abandon you, and impiety will be incurred. Verse 34 For all time to come, people will speak of your infamy, and for one who is great, infamy is worse than death. Verse 35. Illustrious warriors will believe that you ceased fighting out of fear. You will fall into disgrace in the eyes of those that hold you in great esteem. Verse 36. Your enemies will insult you with slanderous words, condemning your prowess. Alas, what could be more painful than that? Verse 37. O son of Kunti, if you are killed, you will attain the higher planets and if you are victorious, you will enjoy the earth. Therefore be confident of your success. Stand up and fight. Verse 38 Maintain equanimity when faced with happiness and distress, gain and loss, victory and defeat. Fight, and in this way you will not incur impiety. Anuvriti Arjuna's social position was that of a kshatriya, a member of the warrior class. As such, it was Arjuna's solemn duty to uphold righteousness and to protect the kingdom from aggressors. By law and social decree, Arjuna and his brothers were the rightful heirs to the throne. Yet the throne had been usurped by his uncle Dhritarashtra. Arjuna, his wife Draupadi, his mother Kunti, and his brothers Yudhishthir, Bhima, Sahadev, and Nakula had all been forcibly exiled from the kingdom. Shri Krishna knows the temperament of Arjuna very well, and therefore he is appealing to Arjuna's Kshatriya spirit to stand and fight. Krishna reminds Arjuna that only shame awaits him if he neglects his duty. His enemies will speak ill of him and claim that he is a coward. Such neglect of his duty will lead to infamy, not to glory. 
A Kshatriya, when called to battle, should never abandon his duty under any circumstance. Krishna tells Arjuna that if he is killed in battle while defending the kingdom, such an act of heroism will promote him to a higher status in his next life. Or, Krishna says, if he is victorious in battle, then he will regain the kingdom and enjoy life on earth. In any case, Krishna strongly encourages Arjuna not to abandon his duty. Verse 39 O Arjuna, son of Prita, I have revealed to you the knowledge of individual consciousness. Now hear how to act upon this knowledge, through which you will be able to release yourself from the bondage of action. Verse 40 There is no loss, nor is there any diminution of result in performing this dharma. Even the slightest effort saves one from the greatest fear. Verse 41 O descendant of the Kurus, spiritual intelligence is one-pointed and exclusive. However, the intelligence of those that desire mundane enjoyment is many-branched. Verse 42 O Partha, those of small intelligence misinterpret the Vedas and claim that there is no divine principle in creation. Thus they glorify those statements that are pleasing to the senses. Verse 43 because their hearts are filled with selfish desires, and their goal is the higher planets, they prescribe many rituals that award higher birth, wealth, and power, and lead to enjoyment and opulence. Verse 44 By such ideas these persons, contemplating sense gratification and mundane pleasures, do not attain the resolve to fix their minds on the Supreme. Anuvriti the greatest fear that is mentioned in the above verse is the fear of losing the human form of life and taking birth in an animal body or lower. Some people think of the consciousness that is generally called Atma as being human and other Atmas as being animal, etc. But in reality, no such distinction between a human Atma and an animal Atma exists. One transmigrates according to one's karma through many lower species of life and eventually arrives at the human stage. Human life offers one the opportunity of self-realization, or the chance to cultivate spiritual knowledge and awareness. One who attempts to become self-realized is not always successful in one attempt or in one lifetime. However, Sri Krishna gives us the assurance that even a little endeavor on the path of self-realization will save us from the greatest fear, namely that of taking birth in a lower life form. The perfection of self-realization in the yoga system is called samadhi, or the complete absorption of our consciousness in the Supreme. The student of bhakti yoga achieves such a state of self-realization by following the instructions of Sri Krishna with steady determination. This state is only possible due to the great boon of having attained a human form of life. However, if one neglects the opportunity of self-realization in human life, then one certainly runs the risk of sinking down into animal life or worse. It is sometimes argued that animals like cats and dogs have a better, more comfortable life than many humans, and that is certainly true for many cats and dogs in Western countries. But there is no guarantee that in losing the human form of life, one will become a dog or cat and be taken care of by a rich American family. One may become an animal that is eaten alive by wild beasts or torn apart by predators in the sea. Certainly, it goes without saying that such a life and death is full of suffering. Therefore, to avoid the unnecessary suffering found in animal life, a person who has achieved the human platform should with great determination and diligence pursue the path of self-realization as outlined in Bhagavad Gita. Verse 45 the Vedas deal with subjects in the three modes of material nature. O Arjuna, become free from duality, situated in a state of pure spiritual consciousness, free from the pursuits for gain and preservation, and thus you will transcend these three modes. Verse 46 A large lake serves all the purposes served by a small pond. Similarly, one who is the knower of the absolute truth realizes all the purposes found within the Vedas. Verse 47 Your right is to perform your work, but never to the results. 
never be motivated by the results of your actions, nor should you be attached to not performing your prescribed duties. Verse 48 O Dhananjaya, stand firm in yoga, perform your activities, giving up attachment, and be equipoised in both success and failure. Such balance is known as yoga. Verse 49 O Dhananjaya, fruit of activities are by far inferior to the yoga of wisdom. Therefore take shelter in the wisdom of equanimity. Those that are motivated by the fruit of results of their actions are misers. Verse 50 a wise man refrains from performing both good and bad actions in this world. Thus, engage in yoga, as yoga is the best of all activities. Verse 51 The wise give up the results of their actions, and thus liberate themselves from the bondage of material birth and death. Thus they attain the plane beyond all suffering. Verse 52 Once your intelligence is able to pass through the dense jungle of illusion, you will become indifferent to all that has been heard and all that is yet to be heard. Verse 53 When your mind is no longer affected by the false interpretations of the Vedas, then you will attain the perfect stage of yoga. Anuvriti To be situated in transcendence means to be liberated from the three modes of material nature, the modes of ignorance, passion, and goodness. Tamagun, Rajagun, and Sattvagun. Yoga is the practice of becoming situated beyond the modes of nature. Everyone in the material world is under the three modes of nature, and only a true yogi can surpass these modes. Our activities are categorized in three ways. As action prescribed by the Vedas, or karma, unauthorized action, or vikarma, and transcendental action, or akarma. Karma means those activities that derive a good result and sometimes promote one to higher planets or higher standards of living. Vikarma are those activities that are against the Vedic injunctions and cause suffering to the self and to other living creatures. Akarma means those activities that have neither good nor bad reactions. One who is wise and who knows the science of yoga always strives to perform the activities of akarma. Such yogis are known as bhakti yogis and can easily situate themselves in transcendence. Other systems of yoga, such as Ashtanga yoga, Raja yoga, Kundalini yoga, Hatha yoga, and Kriya yoga, can also reach transcendence, but the path is very difficult, especially in this modern age. Sri Krishna is known as Yogeshwara, the supreme master of yoga. And although Bhagavad Gita discusses other yoga systems, it is the bhakti yoga system that Krishna ultimately recommends. The yogi, situated in bhakti yoga, is always engaged in devotional activities to satisfy the supreme master of yoga, Sri Krishna. Thus the bhakti yogi is always in complete control of his senses. Without control of the senses, no one can perform meditation or engage in spiritual practices properly. Therefore, the bhakti yogi is the topmost yogi because he is engaged in the topmost yoga system. There are eight mystical perfections of yoga known as the ashta siddhis. These perfections are becoming very small, anima siddhi, becoming lighter than air, laghima siddhi, being able to retrieve anything from anywhere, such as extending one's hand while in New York and picking a mango growing in India. Prapti Siddhi, to become heavier than the heaviest, Mahima Siddhi, to create something wonderful or to destroy anything at will, Ishitva Siddhi, to control the material elements, Vashitva Siddhi, the ability to fulfill all of one's desires, Prakamya Siddhi, and the ability to assume any form one wishes, Kamava Sayita Siddhi. As the master of yoga, Krishna has these eight yoga perfections in full. It is sometimes claimed by yogis that they have achieved one or more of these ashtasiddhis, and such seems to have been relatively common in ancient times. But in modern times, the claim of having one of the ashtasiddhis, more often than not, turns out to be fraudulent or simply a show to attract many followers. With the rise in popularity of yoga, 
false claims of Ashtasiddhis have become a lucrative business. A higher aspiration for the yogi is not the achievement of the Ashtasiddhis, but the achievement of samadhi in bhakti yoga, because such an achievement frees one from the cycle of birth and death. Verse 54 Arjuna said, O Keshava, what are the characteristics of that person who is perfectly situated in divine wisdom and fully absorbed in pure spiritual consciousness, samadhi? How does he speak? How does he sit? How does he walk? Verse 55 Bhagavan Sri Krishna said, O Partha, when the living being abandons all material desires that enter the mind and becomes self-satisfied within, then that person is said to be situated in divine knowledge. Verse 56 One whose mind remains undisturbed by distress, who has no desire for pleasure, who is free from mundane attachment, fear, and anger, is a sage of steady mind. Verse 57 One who is unattached to anything in this world and who does not become joyful or resentful on attaining good or evil is firmly established in wisdom. Verse 58 When one is able to withdraw the senses from sense objects, just as a tortoise withdraws its limbs, then he is firmly established in wisdom. Verse 59 An embodied living being may renounce sense objects, but the taste for enjoying them remains. However, this too also ceases for one who realizes the Supreme. Verse 60 Yet the turbulent senses can forcibly steal the mind of even a wise man of sound judgment, O son of Kunti. Verse 61 Restraining all the senses, a self-controlled person should fix his mind upon me. Thus he becomes firmly situated in divine knowledge. Anuvriti As previously stated, there are numerous yoga systems. Sri Krishna states unequivocally that by the system of withdrawing one's senses from the objects of the senses, namely sound, touch, taste, smell, and sight, for sense satisfaction, and concentrating the mind on him, one becomes firmly situated in divine knowledge and samadhi. Simply suspending the senses without positive engagement for advancing in spiritual life is not very profitable. Many yogis have tried giving up sense activities altogether, but because the taste or attachment for sense objects remains, many have fallen down in their attempts. However, the senses of the bhakti yogi who follows Krishna's direction are safeguarded because the senses are engaged 24 hours a day in Krishna's service. As such, the taste for sensual satisfaction gradually dries up and disappears, leaving the bhakti yogi free to advance spiritually. One who cannot control the senses cannot concentrate the mind. Additionally, the senses are never actually satisfied by material engagement. The senses become satiated for some time, but then again become stimulated with an even greater avarice. Those who are servants of the bodily senses can never become masters of the self. Being fully absorbed in pure spiritual consciousness, or samadhi, means to be conscious of Krishna as the Supreme Person. Such absorption of the mind and senses in Krishna is called Krishna Consciousness. Verse 62 By meditating upon sense objects, one becomes attached to them. From attachment, desire appears, and from desire, anger manifests. Verse 63 Delusion manifests from anger. Delusion causes bewilderment of memory. Bewilderment of memory causes loss of intelligence. And when intelligence is lost, one is destroyed. Verse 64 However, one who can control his mind and senses and is free from both attachment and repulsion, even while in the midst of sense objects, attains divine grace. Verse 65 When one attains divine grace, all miseries cease. Certainly such a person who achieves a tranquil mind develops divine wisdom. Verse 66 One who is bereft of self-control cannot attain wisdom. Without wisdom one can never meditate. 
One who cannot meditate cannot achieve peace, and without peace, how can one attain happiness? Verse 67 Whichever sense the wandering mind becomes absorbed in, that sense carries away the intelligence, just as a ship at sea is swept away by a strong wind. Verse 68 Therefore, O mighty-armed Arjuna, one whose senses are fully withdrawn from the sense objects, is firmly established in divine wisdom. Anuvriti Unfortunately, there are many charlatan yogis who, for the sake of money and gaining disciples, give their so-called blessings, advocating that there is no need to follow any particular practice of sense control, such as a non-violent diet, sexual abstinence, or avoiding intoxication, etc. Such charlatans cheat and mislead their followers into thinking that they themselves are gods and that they can enjoy whatever their senses fancy. But fair warning is given here. Such uncontrolled sense activities lead not to divine grace or divine wisdom, but to attachment, then increased desire, then anger, then delusion, bewilderment, loss of intelligence, and ultimately to destruction. Verse 69 That which is day for the self-controlled sage is night for all living beings, and that which is day for all living beings is night for the introspective sage. Verse 70 Such a sage who is steadfast in facing the constant flow of desires, and who does not strive to satisfy them, achieves peace. He remains unaffected, just as the ocean remains calm as rivers enter into it. Verse 71 Only one who abandons all desire for sense indulgence, who lives free from possessiveness and is free from false ego, can attain peace. Verse 72 O Partha, having attained realization of the Absolute Truth, one is never bewildered. If one is situated in this state at the time of death, one attains Brahma Nirvanam, the abode of pure consciousness, and all suffering ceases. Anuvriti The highest achievement by accepting the instructions of Sri Krishna in Bhagavad Gita is given here. One who does so at the time of death attains Brahma Nirvanam, the spiritual planets of Vaikuntha, and the mitigation of all suffering. According to the knowledge of self-realized souls, the Absolute Truth has three stages of realization, Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Vadanti tat tattva vidas tattvam yajnanam advayam brameti paramatmeti bhagavan iti shabdyate. Translation The seers that know the Absolute Truth call this non-dual substance Brahman, Paramatma, or Bhagavan. From the Srimad Bhagavatam 1.2.11 Brahman means attaining the impersonal light experience or effulgence of the Absolute. The word Brahman is found throughout the Vedic literature, and according to scholars of Bhakti Yoga, ultimately means Vishnu or Krishna. The Buddhist philosophers take nirvana to be the end of material life and entering into the void. But Bhagavad Gita teaches differently. In the Vedic teachings, there is no void anywhere. Everything is the energy of the Absolute Truth and no existence or non-existence is reconcilable outside of that. According to the prominent sages of Bhakti Yoga, Vishvana Chakravarti translates Brahma Nirvanam as liberation. His disciple, Balade Vidyabhushan, understands Brahma Nirvanam as Paramatma who is Vishnu, the form of liberation. Ramanuja takes Brahman as the Atma and Nirvanam as full of happiness. Madhva takes Brahma Nirvanam as Vishnu or Krishna without a material form. Bhakti Rakshakshidar Maharaj takes Brahma Nirvanam as freedom from material bondage. And A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada takes Brahma Nirvanam as meaning the kingdom of Vishnu or Krishna. In all cases, the devotees of Krishna never accept liberation in the impersonal state of Brahman or the void because they are only interested in service to Krishna and are already liberated. Paramatma means realization of the Absolute, situated in the hearts of all living things, the maintainer of the universe being situated within and in between every particle of matter. 
Bhagavan is the realization of the personal aspect of the Absolute Truth and is considered to be the ultimate stage of self-realization because in that stage, one realizes the Absolute Truth in toto as Krishna, the fountainhead of all energies. The abode of Krishna is known as Vaikuntha or Goloka Vrindavan. Furthermore, verse 71 refers to the ahankara or the false ego that is attached to consciousness when driven by the modes of material nature. False ego presupposes the existence of real ego, that real ego being the pure consciousness of a living being. Thinking oneself to be the material body or thinking oneself to be the enjoyer of the senses is the cause and the effect of false ego. Such false ego never leads to enlightenment, but to repeated births and deaths in the cycle of samsara. The false ego is like a shadow of darkness that covers pure consciousness. The pure ego is non-different from pure consciousness itself. Pure ego is to realize oneself as part and parcel of the absolute truth and eternal servant of Krishna. Om Tat Sat Thus ends Chapter 2, entitled Sankhya Yoga, from the conversation between Sri Krishna and Arjuna in the Upanishad known as Srimad Bhagavad Gita, the Yoga Shastra of Divine Knowledge, from the Bhishma Parva of Mahabharata, the literature revealed by Vyas in 100,000 verses.